what is going to be our area of interest. Um, but first, can I ask you, would you like to open with some general comments, or would you like me to go straight into the open question? Yeah, I'm very happy to be guided by you. Yep. Should we just dive, dive in? Okay. Well, my uh, the starting question anyway is is um, more open in its nature. So perhaps I could ask you, how would you describe your constitutional um, contribution? Sorry, your contribution to constitutional matters over the preceding year. Well, thank you, uh, and uh, pleasure to be here before this uh, committee. Um, there's obviously some day-to-day -day stuff that just is constant, and so I'm in regular touch with the judiciary, uh, including the Lord Chief Justice, uh, obviously the President of the Supreme Court, the, uh, the, the SBT. Um, in particular, I suppose, we, we spend quite a bit of time talking to the President of the Family Law Division because there's quite a lot going on there. And with all the financial implications and the Concordat process with which you'll be well versed, obviously I'm constantly talking about the things that need to be done to uphold the Concordat. Um, more, more specifically, I suppose I would include, in terms of stuff that we've done over the last year or so, the Judicial Review and Courts Act uh, and uh, the reforms entailed in that, including the cart route. Uh, we've published the Bill of Rights, um, and I suspect that has particular constitutional impacts um, from the provisions reinforcing free speech uh, through to the uh, treatment, and I know we're coming on to talk about the Bill of Rights, but things like sections two and three and what that means for the separation of powers. I think that's quite an interesting constitutional aspect on top of all what effectively is the retail political uh, side or dimension of the HRA and the Bill of Rights. Um, COVID recovery and the backlog, that's obviously something that I have to engage with the judiciary on. Uh, we have the HMCTS uh, board, which again, uh, as well as dealing with the nuts and bolts of what we're doing, particularly in relation to COVID recovery, is about really the relationship with the judiciary. Um, and I, sus I suspect that's probably enough for the, the, the in terms of what, what we've done over the last year. Um, well, obviously, some of those points you've listed, I think, will come on to uh, more specific questions: backlog, bill of rights, family law courts. But um, and but going looking forward, what would you put as your top priorities looking forward? First of all, maintaining that relationship is very important. Um, uh, we, we're obviously recruiting uh, the next Lord Chief Justice, and perhaps it would be an opportune moment to, for me to put on record, as I have done elsewhere, um, uh, my tribute personally to the work that the current Lord Chief Justice has done, uh, both um, in terms of the Court of Appeal, but also more generally the approach uh, to, as a guardian of the Constitution. Um, I think we've been blessed with a particularly fine Lord Chief Justice at a particularly challenging moment in time, and uh, I, I'm glad to put that on the record. In, ter in crunchier terms, if I can put it like that, we've also got the Bill of Rights that's introduced. Uh, look forward to um, uh, passing that through the House of Commons and then engaging in a civilised conversation with uh, 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 in the other place. Um, uh, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of discussions around that. Um, parole reform. The parole board is viewed as a quasi-judicial function. It's quite an interesting theological argument about what the parole board does, um, uh, uh, both uh, in terms of constitutionally, uh, but also in terms of public protection. Um, and you'll have seen the reforms that we've uh, consulted on. Uh, we are uh, uh, very close um, to producing the legisl legislation uh, in relation to that. Um, we've also got retention of EU law, um, the, the opportunities to shape uh, that caucus of law according to UK needs rather than a blanket approach. Uh, on the other hand, and I would readily admit that needs to be juxtaposed with the needs for legal certainty. Getting that balance right, I think, is going to take up uh, a fair amount of my time. Um, so those are, the, I think, the key things uh, that I see on, on the horizon. Um, as you probably are aware, that we have produced recently our report on the roles of the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Law Officers, and we 
concluded in that, that the Lord Chancellor should fulfil a wider cross-departmental role in defending the rule of law and educating his or her colleagues on the importance. How do you approach your duty to the rule of law? So it's interesting, I, 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 and, I, and I read the report and uh, I was very happy to respond to it. The, the bottom line is I don't look at it as a sort of um, uh, a, a, a statutory challenge, there's no gap. Um, and it probably helps as having the role of Deputy Prime Minister to have an overarching view of what's going on. I have regular conversations with the Attorney General. Um, that's a very fruitful relationship, was under the previous attorney, it is now. Um, I often dip my toe into various different things as DPM, but obviously uh, where there is any legal or constitutional dimension, I think I'm obviously expected to, to comment in Cabinet or in right rounds or more generally. Uh, so I would say it was an empirical uh, and inductive approach rather than a Cartesian approach, if I can put it like that. But I don't really see any problem with it. Um, uh, the the and and we have I think a prime minister who is quite scrupulous about doing things the correct way and that is always a good way to approach um, constitutional issues. So if, if that sounds like a very malleable or flexible approach, I, I, I would hope it is actually a more effective one. Um, and we're very careful when the legislation that comes through and we have a busy legislative agenda, an ambitious one, to make sure that we are um, uh, protecting the constitution. But also, I've got the confidence to reform it where that is required, and um, the Judicial uh, uh, Review Courts Bill and now Act and the Bill of Rights are good examples of that. So I think we should be confident about doing that in a typically British and pragmatic way, and that's the way I approach it within Cabinet more generally. I think the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, I suppose, raised issues about um, your role in those circumstances, but I think Lord Faulkner, you wanted to ask a question on that issue. Yeah, uh, thank you very much indeed for coming, Lord Chancellor. Um, I took from that answer you've just given that you do accept the Lord Chancellor has got some wider role than other ministers in relation to protecting the rule of law. Yes. In relation to the Northern Irish Protocol Bill, not the one that we're talking about now, but in the middle of 2022, the justification for breaking the international agreement that Britain had entered into, the UK had entered into, was the doctrine of necessity. It was described as there was no option but necessity to break the deal that had been done a few years before. Were you specifically consulted about that? What role did you regard the Lord Chancellor as having to play in that issue, which involved breaking an international agreement on the face of it? Yes, I probably wouldn't accept the characterisation you gave, but I understand the question. Um, look, first and foremost, we have an Attorney General. We've uh, got an exceptional Attorney General. We had previously an exceptional Attorney General. One, one thing I, I would just say, um, I don't think it's the job of the Lord Chancellor to be a court of appeal on the Attorney General's advice. Um, it is to assess it, to scrutinise it, to discuss it. Uh, I have long and uh, uh, fascinating conversations with Attorney Generals past and present. Um, but ultimately that's the law officer's role. I'm not sure the rule of law of the Constitution will benefit from me trying to use my role in the way you described, not, not, not saying you suggest this, but uh, to be a court of appeal, if you like, or to try and trespass. What I would always do is want to understand the granular detail of it, which is what I did on the bill, um, and also, effectively, rather than second guess, to support the attorney of the day in making sure that the wider constitutional equities that are reflected in their view of the legal advice are protected and preserved. So uh, it's a curious double act, um, and uh, uh, but I think it works in practice. Again, uh, in, 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 as, as much of our constitution is unwritten. I, actually, I think it works well in practice. It probably does depend on the person. I mean, you'll remember. It probably does depend on the personalities. Um, but I think as long as you uh, develop a modus operandi, uh, I think it can be quite effective. You described yourself as having a good relationship with the current Attorney General. You said unlike the previous one. No, I said and as well as. Oh, sorry, yeah. I apologise. Uh, just to be crystal clear, <laughs> I have an exceptional relationship with Suella Braverman uh, and an exceptional relationship with uh, the current AG, Victoria Prentice. Did you work together with the then Attorney General on the necessity issue? 
Well, again, uh, it's not for me, if you like, and we often do this, don't we, in government, we seek counsel's opinion, uh, the attorney will, and sometimes you seek multiple counsel's opinion. It's not for me to put myself in as either junior or senior counsel in that relationship. What, what I think it is right to do is once the attorney, with or without counsel's opinion, has assessed, scrutinised and then put pen to paper, is to test the ideas. In fairness, quite a lot of other ministers will do the same, uh, whether or not they have the august title of Lord Chancellor. But I think that it's understood um, that there's a constitutional role for the Lord Chancellor in doing so, which is natural and healthy. Um, I think both Attorney Generals are very expert, but also confident, and that breeds a willingness to engage, which is, um, again, going back to personalities, I think that helps. Can you give us an example of where, in your role as Lord Chancellor, defending the rule of law, you've intervened? It's probably not right for me to do so if I haven't already made it public for various different reasons. But I think as Lord Chancellor, and I don't know whether you would agree with this from your uh, experience, um, but you want to protect the discretion of the advice you give. Uh, and sometimes you won't. If, if, I thought, uh, if I thought there was an overt attack on the judiciary, I would be plain speaking and public in my uh, correction of that. It's not for HMG to do. Uh, we haven't had that uh, in my time as Lord Chancellor, um, but I'm very mindful of that. Um, if I thought that there was anything that might lead to that, I would also probably try and nip it in the bud early. I haven't had cause to do so. But most of my advice is given quietly and hopefully assiduously, and is, I think, as with the wider doctrine of cabinet collective responsibility, uh, those discussions <coughs> are held privately. I think they're more effective and more rigorous as a result of that. If we could move on to one of your identified priorities, the Bill of Rights Bill, and um, the implications for the UK being a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. I think, Lord Thomas, you had an opening question on that issue. Yes, okay. the Bill of Rights Bill is intended to overhaul the Human Rights Act, explicitly said, and, quotes restore the balance of power between the legislature and the courts. Um, in your view, which elements of the Human Rights Act fail to maintain the balance of power between the legislature and the courts? And can, can I say this to you? Um, in your Bill of Rights, you, say, you, you provide this. A court may not adopt a post-commencement interpretation of a convention right that would require a public authority to comply with a positive obligation. Uh, and um, everybody's always thought of the Convention as a living instrument which ad ad adapts and adopts to the, to the current uh, situation. But um, you, particularly in advising in the Bill that people look at the preparatory documents to the Convention, which presumably were in 1948 or 49, you're an originalist, as the Americans would say, as opposed to um, uh, um, treating the Bill of Rights, the, the Convention, as a living instrument. Yes, it, uh, I, 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 we could have a, a wonderful symposium on on the question that you've asked. It is uh, far-reaching. Look, um, so. I don't accept your proposition around the living instrument. Living instrument is not contained in the ECHR. Um, and of course, if you look at what Judge Spano, the, the, the uh, outgoing president of the Strasbourg Court has said, is that the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, has shifted from an age where they did look creatively uh, at the ECHR and their interpretations as a living instrument to an age of subsidiarity. It'll be a very interesting question. I was in Strasbourg recently. What the new president, who I, uh, who, uh, for whom I have uh, great regard, um, how, how, how she approaches it. Um, but the living instrument, let's be very clear, and I'll speak candidly so we understand what it was something that is not rooted in the convention uh, and involves a creativity with no democratic mandate. Um, it's actually different from the Human Rights Act in that respect. The Human Rights Act licenses all sorts of creativity, but in fairness, I think the judiciary under uh, Lord Bingham would have said, well, it, Parliament gave us this power and it, it's for Parliament to change. In relation to the Strasbourg Court, the doctrine of living instrument was conjured out of case law. Uh, 
Um, and I think, therefore, that what the Germans would call the Grundnorm of that is very much open to question. Um, I would also note that the Strasbourg case law has ebbed recently in its creativity and has taken a more constrained approach. Of course, what ebbs may flow, and uh, it is a perfectly legitimate question the extent to which any court, domestic or international, is creating law as opposed to applying law. Now, of course, facts change, as you said, um, uh, and facts change over time, and uh, case law will therefore have to adapt to it. But it is quite an important distinction, even if it's a subtle one, applying law, existing law, to new facts as opposed to creating new law. It is un un uh, undeniable that the European Court of Human Rights, under the Living Instrument Doctrine, has created new law. It is also undeniable that there is no provision in the Convention that allows for it. Um, I don't think that that is a literalist approach, uh, or a, 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 in the way you described, but I do think uh, being very careful about the separation of powers is important. In terms of the Human Rights Act, it's a rather different creature, um, but it does uh, allow the importation of that creativity and through, for example, sections two and section three, um, uh, in particular section three, which I do think is pernicious, it allows for the amendment of legislation by the courts in order to force compliance, not just with ECHR, but with that ever-expanding corpus of Strasbourg case law. I think that's wrong, constitutionally on principle. Uh, I suspect at the time, uh, if we look back, I, I, I don't think it was the intention of the architects of the HRA, but I would... I, um, to uh, uh, um, <clears throat> others uh, who were there at the time on that. Um, and uh, I do think that's right for a form, sections two, section three. Um, uh, and you asked another element of the question, which, sorry, has escaped me, but um, I think it's absolutely legitimate. Forget the changes and the, 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 the things that happen, for example, um, uh, the, the, the creeping expansion of Article 8, to make it more difficult to deport foreign national offenders, or the ongoing challenges I have now in prison with people suing. I mean, it's extraordinary. We have under Article 8 uh, uh, terrorist offenders, convicted terrorist offenders, suing uh, HMG uh, for a right to socialise in prison where we deem them a risk uh, in terms of disseminating either extremist material or uh, terrorist recruitment. I find that extraordinary. And that's a direct example of that creativity. So, and, and finally, that was the issue. You asked me about the Travaux Preparatoire. And, you, and, and I think if I understood you, Lord Thomas, and I don't want to characterise or mischaracterise what you suggested was that somehow that was an inappropriate thing to do. As a canon of international law, included under the Vienna Convention of Law of Treaties, it is, particularly when there's a grey area of law, which I often talk about, it is precisely legitimate, not only that, a lawful thing to do, to look at the Travaux Preparatoire to define the meaning uh, of a particular provision in the treaty. I hope I've given a full and uh, not unduly defensive answer to your question. There's obviously yes. room for a great debate on this. But yes, I have, to... I have a little bit of a queue of people on this Sorry. issue. So I, want to... I shall be more disciplined in my answer. No, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't your answer at all. It was my making sure that all noble lords who want to ask you a question on this can be fitted into the time available. Lord Fuchs, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I'd um, like to take you to a different... Uh, Lord Hope, I'm just calling in Lord... Oh, sorry, Pope. make a pardon. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Lord Chancellor. Uh, uh, I followed you uh, in Strasbourg, uh, visiting the Court of Human Rights as part of the delegation, the UK delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly, and we were given the same statistics that you were given, that the United Kingdom, in fact, there are the fewest complaints of any country, that member country. And last year of 260 complaints, 255 were ruled out uh, as are inappropriate to be dealt with by the court. Only five were considered, and only two of those were found uh, to be uh, dealt with by the court, one of which I think was in relation to the, uh, the uh, Rwanda case. So it's a very, very small uh, number. Uh, and you've rightly said that uh, the uh, United Kingdom has no, the government has no uh, contemplation of leaving uh, the uh, convention of, of 
coming out of the Convention of Human Rights. Will you confirm that today? Thank you very much. Um, look, we have got a very good record, and we should be proud of our record, not just of compliance, but also founder members of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the International Criminal Court. I'm doing a lot of work, just I know it's an aside, but a lot of work with Kareem Karak Khan, a British prosecutor, the ICC. Joanna Corner um, was elected as well, an exceptional um, uh, uh, advocate and now judge. Um, so we should be proud of our record. Um, equally, uh, there are uh, uh, moments where, I indeed, the Strasbourg case law and the principle of uh, the marginal appreciation call for dialogue. It is not an illegitimate thing to test, particularly given those amorphous parameters of case law and the fact that there isn't a strict doctrine of precedent in, in Strasbourg. It, it is absolutely legitimate to press. Uh, we did it on prisoner voting, and everyone told me we'd be kicked out of the Council of Europe. I was the junior minister at the Minister of Justice and under David Cameron, and people said that we'd be expelled from the Council of Europe and that we'd, or that we had to give prisoners the vote. I went over and I had a conversation with the Committee of Ministers. We didn't give prisoners the vote, um, and we didn't fall out of the ECHR. And I made clear at the time our respect for the institutions. And this idea that you have to, um, and it's perhaps a peculiarly British, or I should say English and Welsh phenomenon, as common law countries, particularly common law countries, that we think we um, we all operate to a doctrine of precedent, whereas it isn't really the way continental domestic systems, let alone the international courts, work. And our ability to challenge sometimes is right, and the margin of appreciation recognises. On your particular point, um, <coughs> and, and the Bill of Rights, I think, encapsulates that, but within the bounds of the Convention. Um, the, the government's position on the ECHR, as, as I made clear in relation to Bill of Rights, is that we would intend to stay a state party. Indeed, we retain the ECHR in a schedule. If you're asking me whether we're committed forever and a day to staying with the ECHR, the answer is that's not a commitment that we're uh, able to make, and that depends a little bit on the court. But I, I made the, co the point when I was in Strasbourg that we feel uh, more, not less, committed to the Council of Europe as a result of Brexit. I think we've shown our European credentials in relation to Ukraine, what we do in NATO. Uh, it's not a question of rejecting Europe. In fact, I actually see the Council of Europe as an opportunity, not just in terms of the court, but some of the other work they do, for example, raising fair trial standards, good opportunity to show we can be an even stronger European neighbour. That's very helpful. But you haven't said quite clearly that there is the government policy, current policy, is that there is no intention to withdraw. No I set out meticulously and correctly and accurately precisely the government's position. Yes. I'm happy to do so again. Right, and because it's very important <coughs> in relation to the other countries which have a, a, a far worse record than we do uh, in relation to human rights. Well, I agree, but I, I was a bit frustrated that with our record in the way you described and our democratic credentials, uh, that there is any suggestion of moral equivalence with other countries, I mean, for example, before Russia was expelled, the idea that because we kicked up a fuss over prisoner voting, we put on the par with Russia. I mean, if anyone is, I mean, we just need to be a bit careful about that. I also understand, I mean, I understand the point you're making, that setting a good example and maintaining high standards is important and sends a message to the world. As a former foreign secretary, as well as a current Lord Chancellor, I get that. But there's the suggestion that if we push back at the margins on something like prisoner voting, we're somehow on a par with Russia, which is sometimes the argument here. I, honestly, we need a little bit of a stronger moral compass in the area. We're, we're getting delegates from other countries raising with us the fact that the Home Secretary says that she wants the UK to withdraw. Uh, and that undermines our position. What can be done to stop the Home Secretary uh, saying that and get her to stick to government policy? fundamental principle of the ECHR and uh, quintessentially British right is to express yourself freely, uh, particularly in the course of a leadership conference. But, but Lord, <laughs> Lord Fuchs, can we, I, I just, we've got some really important points still on this okay. question, if I may. Um, I know, Lord Hope, you wanted to raise some points on the Human Rights Act in the Constitutional Settlement. Do you want yes, to can I take you, and good morning, uh, can I take you a completely different aspect of the Human Rights Act, <coughs> which is the part it plays in the devolution arrangements yes. across the devolved administrations. Uh, as you know, it, um, the legislatures of all three uh, devolved administrations uh, cannot act or legislate incompatibly with the Convention. And the Convention also affects the powers <coughs> of ministers because they can't act incompatibly with the Human Rights Act. 
Now, the Bill, of right, the Bill of Rights, as I understand it, is to apply across all four parts of the UK. And I think I'm right in saying that you're proposing to uh, amend the devolved uh, settlements by simply changing the word Human Rights Act to the Bill of Rights, or Bill of Rights Act, as it will be. Is, is that right? Um, well, the, the bill's been published, so you can see that, w that the name. But, I mean, just more generally, uh, the, the position uh, on devolution is that the HRA is a UK-wide piece of legislation. It's not actually a reserved power, but it is a protected enactment under the devolution settlements. So any amending of it can only be for the Parliament in Westminster. Of course, the devolved legislatures can, before and after, legislate on human rights issues within the ambit of their devolved competencies. To that extent, there is already some measure of variable geometry in relation to human rights, uh, and I think that's natural and it follows from the devolved settlements. It's also quite similar in other common law jurisdictions, I think to, to a degree in Canada, for example. Um, in terms of uh, our approach um, to the Sewell Convention, which I think you were touching on as well, but, but correct me if I'm wrong. I wasn't going to. You weren't. Okay. I, well, in that case, I will not tread where angels, mm. uh, I will not uh, trespass where angels fear, fear to tread. An entirely separate issue. Uh, but, um, can I raise the question of the, the Good Friday Agreement? Yes. Uh, because I don't think you can change the Good Friday Agreement, and there's no attempt in the bill, as I understand it, to do that. The, the, the Good Friday Agreement is quite simple and straightforward. It simply states that um, uh, the government is in court incorporating uh, the Convention into Northern Ireland, uh, providing for direct access to the courts and remedies for breach of um, the Convention. So um, the, the way in which you, the bill is changing the balance between the courts and the legislatures, um, it, I don't think affects the working of the Good Friday Agreement. You're absolutely right in that. I share that interpretation. I'm heartened by your, uh, your, your, your take on it as well. Yes. Well, the reason I've introduced this is that it has been suggested by some people that that would create a, a risk of confusion between two different approaches to the Convention. You've got the, uh, the reform situation which uh, the Bill of Rights would create, and particularly in regard to free speech and so on, uh, where there's a, a very important change in the balance which you're proposing. Uh, and then, can I say, the very simple and straightforward approach in the Belfast Agreement. Is there a risk of confusion? I don't believe there is any more than currently uh, as a result of the um, devolved settlements. Uh, but the, the truth is, we, we, we don't have, I mean, the, the devolved settlements are obviously enacted, but we don't have, um, if you like, an overarching written constitution. And, and I'm, I'm not suggesting we trespass into that. And therefore, what we've tended to do is deal with these issues bit by bit. Um, and I think the Bill of Rights preserves. Um, certainly in relation to Northern Ireland, uh, the, the, the right balance of power. And certainly, we've been very careful in the drafting to avoid any impingement on the Good Friday Agreement. Right. <coughs> I'll ask about Article 6. Yes. The convention. That's played a major part in Scotland in reforming the way in which criminal prosecutions are handled. Is there any suggestion of change to the way the courts apply Article 6? In, in uh, Scotland or more generally? Generally. Well, Scotland in particular, of course, but mm. because there's a huge amount of case law built on Article 6. And, um, and uh, I'm not quite sure what, if anything, you're proposing. But to change the balance between mm. the courts in relation to the interpretation of Article 6, which has been of great benefit mm. to the proper handling of criminal prosecutions mm. in Scotland, would be a significant change. And I'm but not sure where you're going. We, we've set out in the Bill of Rights our approach to the procedural framework, including um, section 6, I don't believe it would have, it would risk any of the consequences that you say, but I'd be very happy if you wanted to write to me with any particular concerns to respond very carefully. Well, I, I don't have a particular point, I'm not really just searching generally that you're aware of the fact that Article 6 right. has played a major part in reforming the way cr criminal prosecutions are handled to the benefit of the system, and uh, one wouldn't want to change that, I would have thought. Mm. Point well registered. Okay, we may take you up on your offer, thank you. We, um, I've got, just, we've got other pressing questions. Just two more questions and then we'll move on. There's Lord Howard and Lord Anderson have got questions. Lord Howard. Good morning, Lord Chancellor. Um, just to set the record straight, Lord Thomas said that everyone agrees that the Convention <laughs> is a living instrument. You have uh, made it clear that that is not the case and you are not alone in dissenting from uh, that proposition. 
Um, one of the problems with the Human Rights Act is that it invites our judges to decide on issues of proportionality, um, something which uh, some of us at least thought should be the job of elected politicians to decide. Uh, to what extent will the, the, the Bill of Rights uh, modify the extent to which our judges will continue to receive that invitation? I think uh, there, there are lots of areas, but um, let me try a couple. Um, I think sometimes we will explicitly um, qualify a right to avoid expansive interpretations. Article 8 is the obvious example. In fairness, and uh, I, I think Article 8, Paragraph 2, does invite states' parties to do that. It is a positive right set out with a series of qualifications, which I think, exactly as you've said, Lord Howard, are the, the precise balance up to a point, as long as you're not emasculating the right, are for elected legislators, le elected and accountable legislators to decide. So that's one way of doing it. There are other areas where we actually strengthen rights. I mean, free speech we want to reinforce. I think that's a quintessentially UK right. Uh, it has been challenged in lots of different ways. People talk about wokery, but, but I also think of judge-made privacy law. Uh, that is quite contrary to a British UK-wide tradition of transparency and accountability. In any event, uh, of course, uh, strengthening free speech, I think, uh, both in its own right and in its balancing with other things like Article 8 is a <coughs> legitimate thing to do. More generally, um, uh, sections 2 and 3 of the HRA, preventing the elastic case law in Strasbourg from automatically being imported, um, section uh, 3, whereby effectively you invite courts to amend legislation, uh, I think are areas where the, the procedural framework will be considerably tightened. Um, again, I make the point that I know my, I, I can see uh, Lord Anson twitching at my, my reference to section 2, of course the case law as in Strasbourg has ebbed. Um, it's not for me to comment on uh, the Supreme Court uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the merits of its approach, but I think as a matter of fact uh, a lot of commentators <coughs> agree that it has taken a much more strained, restrained approach than previous courts under previous compositions. Um, of course, it's also the case that if you curtail Section 3, you may invite more declarations of incompatibility. Um, uh, you may well end up in Strasbourg a little bit more. I think it's at the margins, but I think that's quite healthy. I think it's healthy because in exactly the way you described, it's for elected parliamentarians to wrestle with socio-economic questions or precise balances, and it's for the courts to say, hold on, you've impinged on the fundamental right. It's not for the court then to dive in and rewrite the legislation. I'm not criticising the courts, um, not only because of the shift in approach, but also because the HRA explicitly licenses and requires them to do so. I hope that gives you just a, a, a broad outline of, of the approach. I, the, the, we, we don't have a written separation of powers in the UK Constitution, and, and I'm not suggesting we, we, we do that. It's not a very British UK-wide approach, it's not a particularly common law approach. I, doesn't, I don't think that means we should abdicate the importance of the separation of powers. I want robust judges. Uh, I think we've got world-beating judiciary. Uh, we want robust judges taking uh, robust approaches, uh, but understanding the limits of their powers. And likewise, the executive needs to be held to account, and the legislature needs to perform its role properly. Thank you. Lord Anderson, a little bit of brevity at this point would be helpful. Lord Anderson. Thank you. I will be brief. And I think your last answer, if I may say so, went right to the constitutional heart of the Bill of Rights. Um, you mentioned Section 3, which of course is a section that allows the judges to interpret statutes in a way that Parliament didn't necessarily intend. <coughs> I understand that you describe that as pernicious uh, because you think that is the judge trespassing uh, onto the functions of Parliament. My first question I think you've answered. I was going to ask you whether you thought that if you got rid of Section 3, there were going to be more declarations of incompatibility by the courts, and I think you accepted just now that there will be more. But my second question, again, is a constitutional question. There has, I think it would be fair to describe it, um, uh, there has been a, a convention over the past 20 years or so 
that when there is a declaration of incompatibility and the government has appealed it unsuccessfully right to the top, then the government will change the law uh, in obedience to the judges, which has declared the law uh, to be incompatible with the Human Rights Convention. What I'm asking you is whether you anticipate that that convention will remain as declarations of incompatibility become more common after your bill comes into force and Section 3 has been repealed. Thank you. Um, and a, a, a very legitimate and uh, articulate challenge as ever. Um, by the way, I don't think... I, I, let me just be honest between us as, as, as colleagues, and uh, uh, I don't accept that Section 3 is, is purely about interpretation. It is about amending legislation. Um, that is what the power does in effect. Uh, I understand that sometimes the, 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 there's a vanishing point between interpretation to new facts and, in fact, changing the rules. I, I've got no doubt that the combination of sections three and two has at least uh, previously resulted in that kind of amendment of legislation, and that is the point of principle. Um, will we end up with more declarations of incompatibility? Uh, maybe at the margins, but of course government will address its approach uh, to the new settlement. So uh, uh, th there was, of course, only under previous Labour governments, I hasten to add, but perhaps a little bit of laziness um, in the drafting of legislation um, I'm, I'm teasing Lord Faulkner, but a little bit of laziness in where if something was a bit rough around the edges, quietly it was always understood that the courts would refine it. I, I, I don't think that's an honest approach, and I don't think it's a correct approach. Um, and I'm sure Lord, Lord Faulkner would, may take issue with it, but there is, there is certainly a sense of within that particularly hyperactive legislative period in the noughties, um, uh, that, well, you, lots of stuff coming onto the statute book, but the courts would straighten it out, and by the way, we've given them the tools to do so. I think that's wrong. And we all, we all, we all, so I, I'm not clear that, the, that, that uh, correcting that would necessarily lead to more declarations of incompatibility. It could lead to more thoughtful legislation. But if there are declarations of oh, incompatibility, this is my question, will the government uh, comply just, with them, or will uh, they leave it to <coughs> To be honest with you, uh, Lawrence, I was trying to whittle away at your assumptions so I didn't have to give a particularly long answer to the more tricky question that you've given me. But, um, but the, the truth is, I'm not sure that there is a convention the way you describe, but certainly a practice. Ultimately, and we spell this out in the Bill of Rights, it's Parliament to write the laws of the land. Uh, the, the reality is, whatever we say about the procedural consequences of declaration of incompatibility, you've got to remain consistent with your international obligations, and I'm not suggesting otherwise. But what you effectively do is Parliament must take responsibility for that, both in the terms of the choice, how and whether to legislate, and quite how nuanced it wants to be, because Parliament can always take a view, there's three options about how we comply with a judgment. We'll take the minimalist approach, let's see how that goes. And that's part of the dialogue with Strasbourg, that's a legitimate thing to do. Ultimately, Parliament also must decide um, if it's not going to comply, whether it wishes to withdraw from the Convention. And a lot of that will depend on the wisdom of legislators and the government, but also on the approach taken in Strasbourg. And I, I think that relationship is a perfectly legitimate, lawful and healthy one to have. Of course, we'd lose our trade and cooperation uh, agreement, um, particularly in relation to criminal justice, wouldn't we, with the EU if we were to actually withdraw from the Convention? Well, that's speculation. It's not. It's written in the TCA. You know, whether they would exercise what was in the TCA, the the um, I mean, but look, we, we've got ourselves into a good place this week on relationships with our EU friends and partners. Let's not. I don't want to say anything um, uh, that puts that at risk. I want a good relationship with the EU. I want a good relationship in the Council of Europe. I'm the father of a Czech refugee. Uh, I feel very passionately European. Um, I also feel very passionate as a Democrat. Okay, thanks very much. If we could um, move on to criminal funding of criminal legal aid and uh, potential implications for administration of justice. Lord Faulkner, you had a question. Um, the Bellamy report, which the Lord Chancellor's Department accepted, said the problem in relation to criminal legal aid was in order to have a properly functioning criminal justice system, you needed to have a sustainable defence solicitors and barristerial profession that could provide equality of arms for defendants. Um, so as Christopher proposed a 135 million increase in the pay for criminal defence lawyers as a first stage in trying to put the criminal defence side of the 
equation back into an okay state. He describing it as being in a very, very bad state. Uh, and he's saying it's not a sustainable um, profession, the defence bar profession, including solicitors, unless something substantial is done. And he described the 135 million as the first step. Uh, how do you view the state of criminal defence at the moment and what further steps are you going to take to put it onto a sustainable and better position? Thank you, uh, Lord Faulkner. Look, I, I first of all pay tribute to Lord Bellamy. Um, we were so impressed with his report, we made him a minister, albeit not with responsibility for criminal legal aid. Um, and I think he did an exceptional job. Um, we also published our response. We've boosted the system with the upfront investment, 15% uh, for most fees. Um, this is alongside the wider long-term reforms that he recommended. Um, and actually takes the total increase in spending to over 135 million to uh, it'll be up to 138 million. That takes the criminal legal aid expenditure on an annual basis to 1.2 billion pounds a year. Um, we're, we're also separately looking at civil legal aid, but I know your question was in relation to criminal legal aid. I think we need to see how the uh, system settles down. Obviously, we monitor those areas geographically which have more of a challenge in finding um, criminal legal aid lawyers. And there are some structural issues around access to the profession um, uh, and advocacy rights uh, and uh, that we also need to look at very carefully. Um, but we've come in and, and, and you know, this, this issue, I think in fairness, had been long overdue. Um, it, we own it, it's our um, uh, policy and, we, and, and our review, but I think the legal aid system had come under challenge for under, under successive governments. And we've taken an important step in investing in it to make it fit for the future. Um, there will be more challenges and we'll, we'll, we'll look at them prospectively. But I think actually we've set the foundations now for a sustainable criminal legal aid profession. I mean, there's nothing in that answer, if I may say so with respect. Uh, Lord Bellamy made it clear that it was the first step. I'm interested to know what the second and third and fourth steps are. Me set out, and they were phased in terms of the immediate financial uplift and then the structural reforms. So the structural reforms that you're, you're well versed in, uh, they're all uh, under, uh, underway. And I'm happy to look at the second, third and fourth steps. But I think it makes sense to see how effective the first step has been and how sure-footed uh, before we decide at what scale of further intervention is required. And we've just put a massive amount in. Um, the, idea, the, the, the idea that we have a low expenditure on criminal legal aid, given the figures I've just set out, I think, think I'd want to challenge. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep looking at it. If you've got any particular reforms you think we need to be considering, I'm always uh, willing to consider it um, uh, at a particularly financially stricken time. Thank you. You must have some contingency plans if you continue to see a sustained decline in the number of um, solicitors engaged in continued legal aid work. You well, we've, got the, we've, got, we've got the um, uh, public defender uh, regime. Um, we've got other uh, opportunities. And there, there is always the opportunity to look at the settlement again in theory. I think in reality, given the financial strictures, that's very unlikely to produce any extra money. Mm. I do think it needs structural reform um, and of course I think uh, my experience is people are more likely to come forward with propositions to increase the budget than to change and reform the system. Um, I would also say though I, I, I think uh, with Kirsty Brimelow um, uh, who I've met with and uh, is very serious and concerted there is also an opportunity to engage with the CBA in a uh, different way, a more constructive way, and certainly as the Secretary of State and the Lord Chancellor, I greatly welcome that. Lord Thomas, I think you had a follow-through yes, question. I was involved in the, um, at the beginning in supporting the public defender scheme, mm -hmm. um, but it is still a minute part of the defence uh, service, is it not? It's a small proportion, uh, not least because there's so much opposition from within the profession to it. You referred to advocacy rights, and of course that immediately <clears throat> makes criminal uh, barristers feel that um, you are going to uh, possibly enhance the position of uh, solicitor advocates. Is, is that within your contemplation? 
I wouldn't regard it as enhancing so much as levelling the playing field. I came to come at this as um, I trained as a competition lawyer uh, way back when. Um, and I, I suppose I look at it a little bit like that. And, and, and I think we need to be clear what our priority is. Our priority is the consumer of legal aid services. Uh, of course we recognise the role of the practitioners. They're, they're, they're absolutely instrumental. But our overarching duty is the public that benefit from the service. But we've just talked about two things, the public defender service and uh, advocacy rights for solicitors. And you're quite right. Um, whenever we talk about anything other than money, there's huge opposition from within the sector. Yes, well, you would presumably want to see a skilled bar, criminal bar, still in existence, wouldn't you? Yes, of course. And I would also like to see a diversity of provision, uh, which gives us, uh, as we talk, we talk about supply chain <coughs> given COVID, but a, a diverse uh, profession uh, with enough resilience built into it. Um, Lord Bellamy is saying, don't change the structure fundamentally. Make sure the one that currently exists works properly. And he was saying, if you only did the 135 million, which you've done, that wouldn't be enough. And I'm reading your answers, Lord Chancellor, as being, you'll wait and see how the 135 million goes down and then you'll make a decision, which doesn't seem to me to be in line with what Lord Bellamy was saying. I, 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 allow me to respectfully disagree. I, I, first of all, um, in, so there's a short and a long term, or short and medium and long term. His short term recommendations we followed almost entirely, including the money. Uh, the only thing I didn't do was on paying for pages of uh, prosecution evidence, because I think that creates a per perverse incentive. Actually, the only two things really, um, structurally, which I didn't agree with uh, uh, Lord Bellamy on, was anything which created incentive to create paperwork, anything that incentive, created incentive to prolong hearings. Uh, those are the only two things of, of all the recommendations uh, from recollection that we... Uh, was he suggesting some things that in prolonged hearings? I don't think he was suggesting it, um, uh, but I wanted to be very careful that if we looked at the reforms across the board that we didn't allow that to happen. And the, exception, the exceptions that I made to accepting the recommendations were those two, as by, by regulation. But look, in terms of the next step, so we've done exactly what, uh, we've more or less exactly what um, Lord Bellamy had suggested. But in terms of the next stage, uh, um, that is at a medium and longer term. And uh, I think given the amount of change that has come through uh, at quite a breathless pace, notwithstanding that I, I know that it took a long time for the Bellamy Review to actually... Uh, conclude and for the government to respond. In fairness, I came back with it very quickly. Um, within within months, I published it. And that was what the CBA advised me to do. And then we've, as quickly as we physically could, introduced the reforms. I think given the scale of that, it's right to just pause for reflection and see what further is required, not least given there are some pretty big questions uh, or in relation to structural reforms. probably leaves us a little concerned, but let's see how we go with the next question. Um, civil legal aid. Le Lord Anderson, you want to... Yes, thank you. Um, the Ministry of Justice has recently launched a review of civil legal aid uh, with a final report due in uh, 2024. Um, the President of the Law Society recently told the Justice Committee in the Commons, over the past five years, over half of civil legal aid firms have left the profession. And uh, the chair of the bar said recently that unless interim measures are put in place to shore up existing provision, there will be no system left by 2025. Well, that sounds quite alarming. Um, are they right? Uh, and if so, uh, do you have any interim measures in mind uh, or indeed any structural plan that might allow the money to go further? I mean, first of all, we're, um, as well as undertaking the review of civil legal aid, we've had the means test review um, and that expanding the scope dramatically significantly. I don't have the figures here but I'm happy to write back if it's helpful Lord Anderson. Um, I, I, there's always a balance between doing the analysis rigorously and swiftly um, but uh, I, I think we need to have the conclusion of the review. If there are th some things that jump out as low-hanging fruit uh, that we or, or uh, essentials that can't wait that long of course I'd be willing to consider it at least.
When I think of how I want a man to love me, you are all I see. Well, Falconer, I think you had a... Uh, in relation to private law family cases, uh, uh, civil legal aid was quite dramatically slashed some time, considerably before you became uh, Lord Chancellor. What work has your department done to see what the effect has been on particularly vulnerable families, but also the amount of court time that is taken up by people not having lawyers? Many people say it makes the process longer and more expensive because the judges have to spend longer dealing with those cases. Yes, I, 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 private. Um, I, I, this is my fourth tour of duty in the Ministry of Justice, and I've always had some locus to look at private family law and public family law. In fairness, private family law, effectively, the situation. And I'll just tell you what I think. There is about fifty-five percent of the cases that end up in the courts, which are safeguarding and domestic abuse. I think they must have a lawyer, uh, a, sorry, a judge dealing with them. I think in relation to the other forty-five percent, effectively. Uh, separation of assets and custodial arrangements, uh, I, I think we should be actively discouraging um, those cases from coming to court. They ought to settle before. So what are we doing about it? I think, and this probably touches on the, the, the financial issue as well, we're investing a huge amount in the mediation and the vouchers to support it. And the thing I want to do is to encourage uh, ADR, but mediation, to resolve those issues without going to court. Uh, aside from the financial saving, I think for those families, and in particular for the children uh, that are, uh, 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 are otherwise going to court, it is a much, much better outcome. I mean, it is agonising to drag children through that process. The, the, the question, the interesting question, is the extent to which the vouchers and the mediation will work. There is already significant evidence from the pilots and the scheme that they do work. And therefore, I think it's a good example of something where we ought to invest, uh, not just to save money, but for better outcomes. And I'm also looking actively, uh, we'll prepare legislation um, uh, in due course, at what, if you like, the mediation is the carrot, what is the, uh, stick's not quite the right word, but the check, so that you don't get people going into mediation, they resolve the issue or they get on the cusp of resolution, but they think they'll double dip and have another crack just in case they could get something better in court. Whether it's cost shifting or fees, uh, I need to look and see how we get the right balance between the incentivization to go through mediation and then settle, and the disincentive to then go to court just because you want another bite of the cherry. And of course, as you know, with private family law, you're dealing with very entrenched disputes and you want to create a virtuous cycle of resolution, not a vicious cycle of continuing the acrimony in court, particularly, as I say, in non-safeguarding, non-abuse cases where children are at stake. Worthwhile sentiments, but what money is the Lord Chancellor's Department spending to ensure the diversion of the 45 per cent of non-domestic abuse private law family cases away from the courts into a mediated or alternative res dispute resolution? I'm doing the allocations now, but they're not spending money at the moment. No, they are on the How pilot. much? I can send, I can, I, let me follow up with the detail. Um, but I'm very happy to do that. Uh, but I'm also doing the allocations now, how we expand the current pilots. I'm sure it works. I'm convinced. Only pilots? I, I'd, I'd need to see, I'd, uh, forgive me, I've, I've gemmed up on uh, the detail of all the constitutional issues, um, but I'd need the figures at hand to see what quite the scope is. We've done pilots, I now want to roll it out, let me come back to you with the detail. But I hope you get the broad sense that it's quite a good example of a pretty substantial structural reform that we'll make, and I definitely accept we'll need to invest in the mediation uh, to make it work. I think it will save us money uh, several times over, and I'm very closely engaged with the President of the Family Law Division on this. And in the meantime? In the meantime, we're rolling out and expanding the pilots, and therefore hopefully reducing... No, I'm saying in the meantime, what about those people who can't get lawyers, who end up in a situation where, for example, they're not entitled to domestic abuse uh, representation and advice, so they're ending up in a situation where they're not properly represented in a dispute, for example, about access to children, for example, about the division of assets? Uh, sure, the existing legal aid arrangements are there. I think they are... They're inadequate, aren't they? Well, I, look, 
I, I think for the long term, we need to make the structural changes that we described. But if you ask me for the short term, um, the, the difference will be the wider changes we're making in the civil law area and including the means test review. But if, you're, if, if your question is um, how much money we're putting into the mediation vouchers, I'll come back to you. If your question is whether I'm satisfied that in the meantime we have the right financial support for those that do rely on legal aid, I'm very happy to give you a, a fuller answer in, in the same letter. In just sorry, public law children cases. Okay, well that's different. That is different. But there is a sense, is there not, that because of the post pandemic problems and a whole range of other problems which predate the pandemic, the public law children cases are now not being dealt with sufficiently speedily and they're not being properly resourced. Give me, uh, Lord Faulkner, I thought you referred to custody rather than guardianship. No, public so, yes. law where the state is... No, I understand. I understand. That's not, I, sorry, yeah, yeah. maybe my mistake. Guardianship orders, yeah. Uh, only guardianship. That is not quite what I thought you said earlier. I thought we were talking about private family law. I'm happy to write uh, about the investment going into that as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know that's an issue for quite a few people outside this committee as well. Um, we need to move on to the next question, I'm afraid. But, um, you know, the Constitution Committee is on record of expressing its concern consistently about the situation in civil and criminal legal aid impacting on administration of justice and that crystallizing into an unsustainable position. Um, and although we've listened to your answers, I mean, I don't know if you want to make any final comment as to what you would reassure us that you will not end up, we will not end up in an unsustainable position. We're obviously monitoring it very carefully. Um, whilst the review of civil legal aid is underway, we are continuing to make the best of the financial envelope we've got. Just to give you one example of that, which I think is uh, acute and sensitive, we're injecting £10 million a year into the housing legal aid through the Housing Possession Court Duty Scheme. There's 13, an additional £13 million going into family legal aid. So, it, I mean, I hope I can reassure you that I'm keeping it very closely under review. Okay, thank you very much. If we can move on to court's funding now. Um, Baroness Suti, I think you had an opening question on that. Yes, um, good morning, Lord Chancellor. Uh, in, the, in the upcoming spring budget, uh, how do you plan to ensure effective and efficient support for the courts, and in particular for capital spending on the, the court's estate? Uh, the outgoing Chief Executive of His Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service has previously said that there are approximately £1 billion of outstanding maintenance in the Court's estate. Yes, look, it's a very important issue. It's one of those issues which, as Lord Chancellor, you, you realise is disproportionately uh, relevant not just to the um, effectiveness of the Courts, uh, but also to the morale and the ability to recruit judges. Yeah, after, if you like, pay and pensions, court maintenance, the state of the courtroom, is probably the single strongest, most prevalent bit of feedback I get. The other point I always make to our friends in the Treasury is that uh, court maintenance, same with prison maintenance, if you lose a courtroom because of uh, court maintenance issues, it is a totally false economy. Um, so I can't speak to what will be in the current budget, the forthcoming budget, but what I, what I, what I can tell you is um, that we've spent £184 million on court maintenance and repairs in the two years to uh, uh, April 2023, so that, that we will have spent that much. Our current 2022-2023 budget for capital maintenance and estates projects is £75 million, and we have a whole pipeline of works, and we prioritise those. Uh, very carefully to maximise the functionality of the state and the resilience. There's also an extra 20 million spent on capital maintenance in 2022 2023 on, <clears throat> if, you, if you like, I, I hesitate to say more minor issues, but uh, repairs and replacement of items like decorating, replacing carpets, furniture, the deep cleans, uh, making sure the fire doors work, as well as the larger scale projects. Um, I think it is a, 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 it's an issue I discuss with the judiciary quite a lot, as well as in the context of HMCTS. Um, and uh, we certainly strive within our budgetary envelope, uh, and frankly as a matter of the Concordat, uh, 
to make sure that we're providing uh, enough to go in. And I'm entirely convinced <clears throat> that notwithstanding the reticence about spending in capital during a difficult financial uh, period, that actually it is really part of the running cost and the operational <coughs> functionality of the courts. Um, and again, I have regular discussions uh, in the last HMCTS uh, uh, board meeting, we discussed this as one of the, the significant issues. One, one of the issues that the Constitution Committee has, has reported on before is this uh, keenness on understanding the investment in IT and in, di in digital enhancement in the court system, mm. its impact on efficiency, throughput, and, in, and data collection to inform more effectively inform policy. And we have seen the National Audit Office report, which does express concerns, particularly about the digital case management system, which, of course, is a key part of it about improving efficiency. Would you want to comment on that? Yes. Um, IT projects in Whitehall have a long and, and less than illustrious <laughs> track record. I would say in the context of the justice system and the court service, it is absolutely imperative uh, that we keep pursuing, learn the lessons, but keep pursuing them. There's a whole range of issues around the common platform, uh, but frankly, I, I just will not succumb to the Luddite view that we abandon that. We've got to make it work. There are examples of good progress. I think we need to get the pace of that right uh, because we need to carry people with us. But I think that's important. In the wider um, court system, there's obviously areas where it's working quite effectively. Um, divorce proceedings, the digitalization in there, Actually, there's some good stats on, on how that's being taken up. Uh, a probate is another area. Of course, in all of these areas, there is a slightly, if I may say, both amongst the clientele and the, those managing the system, there is a demographic uh, difference in view and approach. Uh, but we have a master of the roles who is very much a pioneer and trailblazer in terms of encouraging digitization and IT reform. And uh, I think that has uh, certainly buoyed me when we've had challenges. So there's a lot more to do, but there is progress. And I don't think the situation is as black and white as sometimes is presented. But there's all sorts of frustrations with it. And we need to in in increase, if you like, the digital capacity of the users to make the very best of it, as well as to deliver things like Common Platform and the other digitization processes. But I don't think we've got a choice. No. Um, no. And the sort of... So the, the worst, if you like, vested Luddite sort of critique, I think we need to be quite clear we're taking on. But at the same time, I'm also sensitive to the whole point about learning lessons and getting the pace of, of reform right. Thank you. If we could move on to court back, backlogs. Lord Mancroft, I think we had a question. Thank you. Um, good morning, Lord Chancellor. There's a growing amount of anecdotal evidence in the newspapers about the log jams and delays at all levels in the court system. So could I ask you please, what is the current state of, of the backlogs in the court system? Are there any areas which are particularly under intense pressure? And, and what steps are you taking to address this problem? Thank you very much. Um, so the outstanding caseload in the Crown Court increased, um, I mean obviously Let's take a step back. Obviously, there was a backlog before the pandemic. You always want an element of backlog because otherwise scheduling becomes a problem. Um, but clearly, the pandemic uh, and, for example, the impact in jury trials of the social distancing rules has increased the backlog. Um, we started to get it down. It then increased as a result of the CBA action. Uh, and at the end of October, it was 62,500. It's now decreasing uh, in December. It was down to 61,700. Our aim is to get it down to 53,000 by 2025. There's a whole range of things that we're doing to that effect, um, uh, from uh, Nightingale Court's removal of the, the maximum limit on sitting days. I would say that the single biggest issue is judicial recruitment, and I'm working very closely with the judiciary on that. Um, in the Magistrates Court, uh, the outstanding backlog fell from a peak of 445,000 in July 2020 to 342,200 at the end of December 2022. So still a way to go, but that was progress. In, in family law, the outstanding case load in private in November 2022 
was uh, 52,700. That was quite, that was a slight decrease, but not as much as we would like. And we've talked through some of the structural issues there. Um, and and I, I can talk about, about other areas. Um, but the pandemic has clearly created a problem. Uh, I'm most concerned about the Crown Court backlog. Um, but we do have a plan in place. Um, and whether it's judicial recruitment or the court's maintenance uh, project, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at it, and uh, we will we will push uh, everything to get down to fifty three thousand by twenty twenty five. Lord Hope has a question, and also uh, following Lord Hope, Lord Howard has a question which probably extends the issue to the question of judicial appointments themselves. But Lord Hope, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I'd like to just follow up a bit on the point you mentioned about recruitment of judges, because the Lord Chief Justice last year told us that there was a shortfall in meeting the target. Um, for example, in the case of um, Crown Court circuit judges, he was uh, he was told us he was fell short by ten, which is uh, quite a significant figure when you consider the number of judge days involved, and also the uh, in the um, county court uh, well short of the number of salary judges that are needed. Now the the problem seemed to be that uh, the candidates which were coming for coming forward before the judicial appointments commission. Uh, were not, not enough of them were judged to be a sufficient merit to be appointed, and that suggests there's something wrong in attracting the right people. I wonder whether you can identify beyond the state of the buildings yeah. what other factors affect the shortfall and how they could be corrected. Hubtel presents Fresh and Wamo with all the great delights. Fufu in a flash with Koto, Yemadie, and Akrantie. Almighty Gobe with Koko. And eggs ish. Crispy fried chicken with rice, pizzas, and whatever else you're looking for or need to pay for. Hubtel presents Ghana's most useful app. Hubtel is everything you. Uh, so I, th I, I think um, uh, pay and pensions, uh, although of course we've uh, introduced significant reform in those areas, and state of the court estate, I think are the three most uh, 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 um, significant. Uh, perhaps there's attitudinally a change, I don't know, I, I don't have any more an anecdotal view about um, uh, the, the uh, the esteem that, that it's held in, I don't know. It seemed to me the judiciary are held in very high esteem by the public, and there's quite a lot of polling that bears that out. Um, so I, I, I think it would be important to continue to try and disaggregate what those factors are. But just in terms of what we're doing about it, we're recruiting up to 1,000 judicial office holders as part of the 2022-2023 recruitment programme, and uh, uh, I've approved for 2023-2024 around uh, another recruitment of, of, of a thousand vacancies. We've done the other things around the backlog, but um, we've also approved for 2023, 2024, for the recruitment round, uh, a, a thousand vacancies across all the jurisdictions. So that includes 70, record, uh, 70 circuit judges, 125 uh, recorders. Um, we've got, a, a, as you probably know, a concerted recruitment campaign for more magistrates. Um, we're aiming to get 4,000 over the next few years. We've invested the money in to do that. In terms of where we are now, obviously we monitor it very closely. The High Court is at full strength, so that's good news. The circuit judge recruitment has been challenging um, uh, in the last four years. That's, that's, that's true. We've had shortfalls of something like 23% or up to 23% against the vacancy request, so that's something we're looking at very carefully. But we're quite optimistic that for the current round, we've got a uh, strong field of applicants. And actually, the recruitment of deputy high court judges and recorders has actually been pretty positive. Um, uh, we, we've increased, uh, I've approved the, an increase in the vacancy request um, as there were actually more selectable candidates. So we've increased it from 125 to 172. So there's some challenges there for sure, but it's not, um, it's not all quite as bleak as 
uh, as might be thought at first blush. Yes, there is one point you haven't mentioned, and that is the natural pool uh, for Crown Court judges. Yes, it's of course, the criminal bar, which uh, there are suggestions that it is shrinking for reasons of well understood, the lack of yeah. remuneration and so on. Is, is that something that uh, you are paying atten attention to? Yes, and. Um, Again, it comes to your pool of practitioners will ultimately feed the quality of the applicants that come forward, which touches on perhaps some of the earlier comments that we were discussing um, around structural reforms to, to, to the pool of practitioners. But it is something that I'm very mindful of. Thank you very much. Lord Howard. Lord Chancellor, I'd like to ask you about senior judicial appointments. In your written evidence to our recent inquiry, you said that that was not a current priority. Uh, but no less an authority than Baroness Hale has said that the current arrangements place the Lord Chancellor in an impossible position. Uh, some of us who sat on the previous inquiry um, had reservations about the current position, and um, I, for one, was impressed by the evidence of Jack Straw, who has written a preface to a policy exchange document, with which I expect you're familiar, um, which suggests some modest reforms. Um, do you have um, any plans, despite what you said in your written evidence, to, to look at that issue? Uh, no current plans, but I'm in the market for ideas. I, I haven't read Jack's uh, uh, forward. I will, I, will, um, I will take a look at it. We, of course, the, um, uh, the, the most significant senior uh, recruitment process underway is for the Lord Chief Justice. And actually, that will give me a, a, a good sense uh, of um, of where we are, um, but I think the the, the the three the three key elements are pool of great talents um, and making sure, in a sort of meritocratic way, we encourage the best people to come forward. I think there's also a diversity issue. Um, I'm not known for being a tick box uh, politician on these things, but I think structurally that's true. Probably particularly for ethnic minority uh, uh, members of the bar and the profession, although I think gender as well. Um, so I, 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 we, we, you know, I, I'm certainly in the market for ideas for reform. Uh, I, I suspect you're touching on the, the the role of the Lord Chancellor in it. I mean, it's always difficult because the, the, the Lord Chancellor's role uh, is. Um, quite a flexible, malleable role, but on the one hand we want judges uh, selected on the basis of strict merit. Um, equally, there ought to be some form of democratic oversight uh, uh, over it, and I think the Lord Chancellor is trying to balance both of those things. Uh, and it's tricky, and I'm not sure you ever get a perfect outcome. Um, but in practice, for example, with the Lord Chief Justice's recruitment, I think we'll get a, an exceptional candidate out of it. And I suppose what I'm worried about mostly is what works in real time in front of me. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly willing, if either this committee or individuals like uh, Jack Straw have got ideas, I'm certainly willing to entertain them and to consider them. Stop using your old boring keyboard today. You can even customize your very own keyboard theme, which is really cool. And V Keyboard lets you change the sound of your keyboard. Just download V Keyboard. Thank you. Um, well, this issue is commented on by the Constitution Committee in its report on the Lord Chancellor and the Law Officers. So um, we do, to the extent that, um, you're considering responding to that report. Um, we did highlight our concerns around any changes um, impacting on the politicisation of judicial appointments. But um, by all means, you know, um, when you reply to our report, um, if we could now move on to retained EU law, including the position of judicial uh, pensions. Lord Faulkner, you had a question. Yes, the judicial pensions. Fee paid judges regulations 2017 will be repealed, as you know, Lord Chancellor, by the effect of the retained EU law revocation and reform bill. And the consequence of that repeal, 
will be that the department or whoever pays them will pay £3.5 billion pounds or less on judicial pensions for be paid judges. What is your proposal or what are your plans in relation to that? Are you going to let it be repealed? And if you are going to let it be repealed, what are you going to do about the pensions of fee paid judges? I may need to write to you about the detail of this, um, but look, the, the, the bottom line is that, uh, as again, as I think you know, until March of last year, fee paid judges were able to accrue those pension entitlements under the fee paid judicial pension scheme. After that, they've accrued uh, their entitlements in the new scheme. The new scheme is, is not directly affected by the bill, but I am considering the implications uh, of the bill um, for the 2017 regulations which underpin entitlements to benefit uh, from the old fee pay judicial pension scheme. So uh, perhaps... Are you saying that the judicial pensions fee pay judges regulations 2017 will not automatically be repealed by the retained EU law bill when it becomes law? Uh, from the, uh, let me come back to you, uh, let me look at that specifically and come back to you please. Okay, fair enough. Okay, thank you. Um, Lord Strathclyde, as you had a question on this issue. Thank you, and uh, and, and good morning. I'm I'm a, I'm a new member of this committee, and this is the first of these evidence-taking sessions uh, that I have attended. But I'd like to thank you very much indeed for the clarity of your answers uh, and for coming along. Now, continuing on what um, Lord uh, Faulkner said about the retained EU law revocation reform bill, it is as you can imagine arousing great passions in the House of Lords. Um, so specifically, have you identified uh, in the bill um, other uh, pieces of legislation which are due to be revoked? And what are you doing about that to mitigate the effects or indeed to, to encourage them? It's just a, an overall view of what is your intention. We're looking at this now, and as certainly as it applies to the Minister of Justice, I, I've got four principles. First of all, um, we need to respect our international obligations, including under the withdrawal agreement. If there is retained EU law that is actually our implementing legislation for that, or indeed other things um, that we have where we have international obligations, and, and sometimes the, the I was into I hadn't quite realise the extent of this. Sometimes it's called retained EU law, but actually it's implementing legislation for something tangential, but nonetheless an international obligation. So we, we ought to do that because that's obviously what we should do in terms of maintaining our international obligations. My starting point with the remainder is to look very carefully at whether we can remove or replace. And I have two core principles that guide me. One is, as a pretty uh, committed Brexiteer, is to look for can we do something which is tailored to the UK circumstances in a careful way which adds value. I'm, I'm, less, I'm less interested in the number, if I'm really honest with you, but where does it add value? Is there a regulatory change that will benefit, I don't know, legal practitioners or uh, UK consumers of legal services in some way or shape or form? Or where, for example, uh, because we're not governed by the EU, we can do more internationally. Do you have a third principle to add to the two you've just given us, which is a choice between those two, as it were? And the second thing is to go back in this question of legal uncertainty. You said right at the very beginning that you were very anxious to establish the balance between new opportunities, and you've talked about added value, and the uh, and legal certainty. But we have had a huge amount of lobbying, of course, from the legal bodies themselves about instance, uh, issues around legal uncertainty. And we have been debating at some length already notions of what happens to case law and interpretive law in the general passage of choice. So what would be your response or your reassurance to this issue that we may be tipping because of the timetable, not least, and the speed that everyone's having to work at, and some of the real ambiguities about retention and amendment of the law as well. What would be your reassurance on that point? I think, I think it's a good challenge. I, I hope to have touched on most of this in my earlier answer, but let me try and uh, break it, unpack it a little bit more. Um, I, I don't start from a presumption of retention. I, I'm not sure why I would do that. Um, what I would start with is 
can we remove or replace in a way which adds net value? And what I don't want to do is lazily scrap or lazily retain. Lazy. You know, quite, quite an exercise to do, there's a huge amount. And we've actually... Uh, um, the, the legal cert uncertainty point is important because that goes to the net value added. If actually you're creating such breathless change that we can't yield the dividend from it, then that becomes counterproductive. I mean, just to give you one example, I met with City UK yesterday, exactly the conversation we had, and I'm very happy to listen to practitioners uh, and uh, uh, in the city and elsewhere. Uh, could you give us an indication of how many sets of regulations the Ministry of Justice is concerned with in relation to the EU retained law bill and what resource you've put on to looking at it? Yes, but I'd need to write to you. I had the numbers at my fingertips yesterday. Um, uh, exactly, I knew uh, you would ask this, um, Lord Faulkner. Let me add it to my to-do list of follow-up uh, issues to write to you about. Okay. I yeah, he's gone. We are going to meet that hard stop. So, yes, a I quick, a very, very quick question. It's, it's just to explore this notion of value adding. The bill does not allow for additional burdens to be placed on any part of the, the totality. There has to be a trade-off between something that goes as well as something that arrives in terms of new activity, whatever it is. How do you reconcile that with your search for value added? What would you lose, for example, if you could give us an example? What would you lose from, re from replacing or retaining? Yeah, if you, if you took out something. If it's unnecessary, well, if it is gold plating, in any event or particularly because we no longer have the EU obligation. Um, so from a deregulatory point of view, uh, I think, I mean, I would start from presumption that we want less, fewer regulations uh, unless there's a good case for them. I think that's a good paradigm actually for legislation more generally. I'm not one to hyperactively legislate. I want to see what's the tangible benefit. Thank you. Um, you mentioned legal uncertainty in relation to the rule bill, and of course that arises not only in relation to uh, retained EU um, legislation, statutory instruments and so on, but also uh, the directly effective EU obligations, whether they derive from the treaty or from directives or indeed from international agreements, uh, which are removed by Clause 3. And I just wondered, we haven't got onto this yet in committee, I anticipate we'll get onto it tomorrow. But it seems to me the scope for legal uncertainty there is at least as great as it is in relation to the uh, legislation. First, because how does Clause 3 interrelate to Clause 7? Clause 3 seems to remove these rights. Clause 7 seems to give the judges the choice whether they continue to apply them or not. But more fundamentally, what is the effect on our law going to be, our common law, interpenetrated for 50 years by these EU obligations, when the obligations are simply wrenched out. And I wondered if you thought there might be some sense, not in abandoning the whole task because it's too difficult, nobody wants to do that, mm. but in taking our time, spelling out what the anticipated consequences of removing each of these rights is likely to be, and then proceeding a bit more deliberately and with a bit more opportunity for Parliament to have a look at what's happening. Because, of course, one thing about the sunset in Clause 3 is that it can't be extended. Mm. So, uh, look... Um in one level, it's uh, I'd need to go back and think about it and give it some uh, wider view. I've looked at this principally from the MOJ angle, inductively. Um, the only thing I would just gently press back, I think in any event, a lot of EU regulation created a measure of uncertainty overall. What um, That is almost superfluous or even more uh, questionable now that we're not uh, a member state. But inevitably, I don't feel so strongly about that that I'm not mindful of of the balance. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe this is a not, you know, I tend to be pragmatic about all of these things. Um, so what I think you need to do is weigh up the, the the pros and the cons. I certainly do agree with you, though, Lord Anson, that we ought to have an empirical basis for it. And we ought to try and search for value added, and uh, I hopefully have convinced you that it, at least in relation to the MOJ swathe, we've done that. Funnily enough, I think if you do you probably end up getting rid of more than you suspected at the beginning. As long as you've got time where it needs to be adapted rather than just repealed to make sure that you really understand what you're...